It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, if we hadn't just heard about the awesome do good shop, about this time of year, that could actually be pretty hard to believe. Now, it can be hard to believe for those of us with long lists of Christmas gifts to buy and a dwindling number of days to do it all. It's more blessed to give than to receive can also seem like a tough sell for those of us with tight budgets or unexpected expenses. Giving is hard and receiving, though it might not be easy, would be a blessing. On the flip side, it is more blessed to give than to receive might sound improbable to somebody who has a long sought after, much desired, long awaited gift that they're about to receive. So if you've been asking for a puppy every year and this is the year you're finally going to get your new best friend, receiving would definitely eclipse giving, no question. But there must be some truth to this statement because however unlikely it may seem, the apostle Paul attributes this to Jesus in Acts 20. So in Acts 20, verse 35, Paul writes, and everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words that Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, if you can't remember where Jesus said that, it's because it's not recorded elsewhere in the Bible. There's no story we see or interaction we watch where Jesus sagely challenges, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It sounds like a variation on a few Proverbs or even a few verses in Psalms, but it's not a direct quote. It's not a beatitude from the Sermon on the Mount, though it sounds like it could be, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Or blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this begs the question, if it's more blessed to give than to receive, what does it mean to be blessed or blessed? Some translations render this original Greek word makarios as happy or as fortunate. But there's a sense with this definition that this is tied into your circumstances. You're happy or you're fortunate because your circumstances are good. But that's not the case for the poor or the persecuted or those who mourn, is it? So in fact, a better understanding of this idea of blessedness is to describe someone who is participating in the nature of God, whose circumstances might help them to experience more of the heart of God, to see life and to live it from his perspective. And so if you read the Beatitudes from that perspective, or if you ponder the idea it's more blessed to give than to receive from that point of view, it makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Wouldn't a life that's characterized by giving help us to enter the heart of Jesus, to live life from his perspective? So this Christmas, in week two of your Advent series, Doing Christmas, we are considering giving. What would it look like to have God inform our Christmas giving? How can the way we give and even what we give reflect God's heart. And how in the midst of all the holiday hubbub, can we reduce stress, increase joy, and lean ever more into Jesus? What would it look like to entrust our giving to Jesus in a way that lightened our load instead of making us feel heavier or more burdened? So let's pray for God to show us his way this morning. Heavenly Father, you are a God of revelation and you reveal yourself to us in your scripture through your son Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. Illuminate the texts that we read, the thoughts that we think, and expand our holy imaginations and our hearts. 
as we reflect on giving gifts this Christmas. Amen. So there are actually five ways, at least, that we can expand our imaginations and our intentions around giving this Christmas. And by broadening how we think about and how we practice our giving, we will discover more joy, release stress, and encounter Jesus. Does that sound good to anybody? Yes. Yeah. So the first expansion is just expanding the why. Simon Sinek would be proud. We're going to start with the why. Why do we give presents at Christmas time? Because it's what we're supposed to do, because it's tradition. Is there anything more to it than that? Well, let's recover the roots of why followers of Christ give gifts to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Now, truth be told, it doesn't really seem like this practice actually dates back to the early church. We can trace Christmas back to the third century, but back then it was actually being celebrated in January. So according to theologian and history professor Donald Fairbairn, the first reference we have to Christmas on December 25th is actually in the fourth century. It's after the emperor of Rome became a Christian and when Christianity began to be institutionalized throughout the Roman government. And so this new December Christmas may have actually been conceived as an alternative to Saturnalia, which was a pagan festival in late December that also involved gift giving, but set against a backdrop of wild partying. And I'm not talking about the kind of partying where you drink too much eggnog and eat too many Christmas cookies wearing the ugliest sweater. Okay, this was wild in in other ways. So this emergence of Christmas right around the same time of year as Saturnalia makes it seem like it was this attempt at actually displacing or replacing Saturnalia. And in that sense, it seems like it was a huge success because I'd never heard of it before, had you? Um, On the other hand, centuries later, as followers of Christ, we're still trying to avoid buying into the secular version of this holiday, of the consumeristic or commercial version of Christmas. And so we have an opportunity this year to be intentional and to think about how the giving of gifts at Christmas can serve to remind us of the Magi who traveled great distances to give gifts to Jesus at his birth. So we're going to read this passage from Matthew 2. Um, And as I read this passage, I'd like to invite you to pay special attention to three things, why the Magi came, what they came to do, and what they came to give. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to his house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warmed in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So we see that the Magi had come to worship Jesus. And they had traveled from somewhere east of Jerusalem, likely the Arabian desert, even as far as Persia, which would be present day Iran. Their journey might have stretched over a thousand miles. They opened up their treasures and they gave Jesus three gifts. 
religious and geographic outsiders to Israel, the Magi came bearing gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And what's so interesting is that these gifts reflect knowing Jesus in a way that would not have been possible without divine revelation. So what did their gifts signify? The gold was the tribute that was given to ancient Near Eastern kings. And the frankincense would have been given to priests for worship in the temple, specifically for sacrifices. And the myrrh was used to embalm the bodies of the dead. And so the Magi gave Jesus three gifts that reflected his identity as king, as priest, and as sacrifice. And at Christmas time, we give gifts to remember the greatest gift, Jesus Christ, given for us. We give gifts as acts of worship, as signs of our devotion for our king, our priest, and our sacrifice. So Christians actually give gifts at Christmas to reenact the gift giving at the birth of Jesus. Now, if our first expansion of our intention, our imagination is to remember this, this reason that we give gifts at Christmas to worship Jesus, who is our king and our priest and our sacrifice, but we give gifts to other people at Christmas, not to Jesus per se. So how can our gift giving be an act of worship? How can our Christmas gift giving reflect Jesus' love for the world? So that brings us to our second expansion, how we practice Christmas giving. We can give gifts that honor Jesus, as we have heard, by shopping fair trade that are made from sustainable materials and from social entrepreneurships that resource the underprivileged. We can support ethical businesses and good causes as a way of living out God's restorative justice for the world. And we see this in Micah 6, 7 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow down before the exalted God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Verse 7, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. I don't know about you, but I am relieved on the one hand that God doesn't need extravagant and lavish material giving from us in order to honor the sacrifice that he made for us. He has shown us what is good. And that's the challenging part. God has shown us what is good through the way that Jesus lived his life. And we honor Jesus when we ask God to help us live our lives like Jesus did. Now, we know that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And in Advent, we celebrate, right, that he came in human flesh, embodied as a tiny baby in the humblest of circumstances, God with us. The word became flesh, learned to talk and to walk on the earth that he had helped create. And so miraculous is God becoming human that we sometimes overlook what Jesus showed us through his humanity. So this Christmas, let's celebrate the way that Jesus lived his life by remembering that he showed us what it is to be fully human and to live according to God's good design to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Jesus showed us how humanity is meant to live. Jesus shows us what is good. Jesus looked for the lost and the lonely and the left out. He looked for the the overlooked and the outcasts and the oppressed, and he honored them and he restored their dignity. This is a way of doing justice. And so supporting ethical businesses and good causes is a powerful way of living out God's restorative justice for the world. So this Christmas, we can honor Jesus in how we give gifts to others by shopping in ways that lift up, that honor and empower 
the oppressed. Now, it might not be that we do all our shopping from fair trade or sustainable sources, but every gift that we do buy from these kinds of social entrepreneurships makes a difference in someone's life. I love that. Together, we can change the world one ethical purchase at a time. I believe that's something that Jesus can really celebrate. But here's how generous our God is to us. Did you know that you actually benefit from this kind of giving too? This is called pro-social spending. It's when we use our financial resources to help other people. And did you know that pro-social spending actually has emotional and health benefits for the giver? Pro-social spending can lower blood pressure, can increase happiness, and even activates parts of our brain that are associated with pleasure. So what's more, according to Stephen Post, he's the director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at Stony Brook University, the neural pathways we create through giving can overcome destructive emotions, such as hostility and bitterness. In other words, pro-social spending is good for the giver. Don't you love it when science reveals an aspect of God's design? God designed us mind, body, and soul in our relationships and in our connectedness with others to be blessed by our giving. He didn't have to make us this way. What a generous gift our generous God has given us to enjoy and take delight in gift giving. So perhaps God's design for our lives might also inspire us this Christmas time to expand who we give gifts to at Christmas time. So that's our third expansion, expanding to whom we give gifts. What if we all prayed for God to show us one person who's not on our shopping list this year who we could bless with a gift? It might be a service provider like a postal worker you could leave a gift bag for them in your mailbox with a note of appreciation. It could be someone you work with who's an unsung hero of sorts. Their, their work could be really appreciated but seldom acknowledged. Could you write a card and give a small gift, maybe one that you find at the Do Good shop today, just to let them know that you appreciate them? Or maybe this person could be someone that you know who is celebrating Christmas far from home or maybe on their own and might not have many, if any, gifts for them under the tree this year. Now, alternatively, this person doesn't even need to be someone you already know. There are lots of opportunities now um, to give gifts to the underprivileged. Many nonprofits will share, actually, Amazon wish lists right on their website so that you can do your pro-social spending from the convenience of your home. And so we've seen that when we give gifts at Christmas, we remember the Magi's initial gift giving, their act of worship in giving gifts to Jesus at his birth. And we've seen that when we give gifts to others by choosing to buy sustainably and ethically in ways that uplift the oppressed, we honor Jesus and the way he called us to live. And we know that we can honor Jesus with our gift giving when we expand to whom we give gifts, who we include by asking him to inform our giving by bringing to mind someone we would not have ordinarily thought of on our own. Now, are there other ways that we can honor Jesus with our gift giving? How else can we reflect the love of Jesus through the gifts that we give? Well, our fourth expansion is simply expanding what we give. And so we can reflect the love of Jesus through the gifts we give by giving thoughtful gifts that show we love and see the other person. So I want you to think for a moment about the best gift that you've ever received. Try to think, think back through your memory banks. Think about either a material item that was given to you by another person or an experience that someone planned for you. But try to think with me for a second about the best gift, the best present that you've ever gotten. anything come to mind? Do you have something in mind? Now, I would guess was part of what that made that gift so special was the fact that you felt seen and known by the gift giver. 
in order for them to give you something that you would delight in, they had to know what brings you joy and delight. They had to know you. So I, I grew up in a non-Christian home, which I've mentioned, and became a Christian as an adult while I was studying abroad in China. It was only the fifth time I'd ever been in a church building in my life, so you can imagine how sudden this must have seemed to my family. And as my faith began to inform and even change the course of my life right down to my career, it probably wasn't easy for my parents. They had certain dreams for my life. But I remember still the first gift that my mom gave me that signified her acceptance of my new life. And it was a hand-carved wooden cross that she had seen at a fair, probably not unlike the one that's out in the courtyard today, and that she had bought for me. And it was as if her gift to me said, I see you, I accept you and your new life. And it was a wonderful, wonderful gift. And a thoughtfully given gift can do that. It can communicate the love and the acceptance that Jesus himself has for us. You can feel seen and known when someone gives you a gift like that. On the other hand, you may have gotten a gift before where you didn't feel particularly seen or known. It just didn't resonate with you at all. You might have even thought like, why on earth did they think I would like that? Do they even know me at all? I hope I'm not the only one who's thought this before. <laughs> Recently, just between us, a kind congregant from my former congregation wanted to send me and Joel off with gifts. And she very sweetly dropped off gift cards to Panera Bread and to Subway. And I did not have the heart to tell her that I am very, very, very allergic to gluten. <laughs> So when I found the cards in my office, I actually, and I opened it up, I felt kind of deflated. It was such a lovely and generous gesture, but I felt so seen and so unknown because for Joel and I, our heart's desire was to sow into the gospel through this church plant. So when I saw the card, I thought, oh my goodness, maybe she's giving a gift to the church plant. And then I was really hoping that it was for the church plant, but it was for gluten. And so I just felt so sad. <laughs> so, you know, it's not her fault. She couldn't have known, but I just felt a little bit extra unseen and unknown by that. So thankfully, um, the story does have a happy ending. Um, and like most presents gone wrong, it involves regifting. So we were actually able to give the cards to a ministry partner who could use them to feed the hungry. So then we had the benefit of pro-social spending and not getting poisoned by gluten. So that was like double the fun. Yeah. That said, counting on someone to get a pro-social spending boost from re-gifting your gift, a little bit of a circuitous way to bless someone at Christmas. So how, practically speaking, how can we go about giving thoughtful gifts that make recipients feel seen and known? So we can just simply consider this person, their hobbies, their interests. Take a moment to picture them in their mind. What do they love? What do they enjoy? How do they spend their time? What do they delight in? Do a little research on related gear or gadgets or accessories. You can read the reviews to figure out what's good. Now, on the other hand, if it would bring someone joy to select their own gear, if they're kind of a gearhead, you could get them a gift card to their favorite retailer instead. So for example, my husband, Joel, is a musician. He loves surfing an online marketplace called Reverb, where you can buy and sell new vintage and used musical gear. And I would never try to buy him something from Reverb. I'm not enough of an expert on it, and he totally is. But he, part of the joy for him is like the surfing and the searching and seeing what's out there and imagining what he could get. And so that gives him joy. So gift cards can be thoughtful gifts too when they're tied to someone's passions or hobbies. So if you're planning on giving some gift cards this Christmas, never fear. There are some thoughtful ways you can do that. And now the, the final expansion that I'd like us to consider, and my personal favorite, <laughs> is how Jesus can expand whatever we bring and whatever we give. And this is especially heartening for those of us with tighter budgets this year who are longing to give thoughtful gifts, but this is equally true for all of us. 
what would happen if we brought what we do have to Jesus, asking him to bless and to multiply it? to increase the joy that it creates for the recipient. Consider the boy with the five loaves and the two fish who gave his paltry meal to feed 5,000. His kingdom heart gave what he had. And Jesus blessed and multiplied that meager offering and made it into something more. And so when our budgets are tight and our our money is stretched thin, when the bills are piling up, it would be so easy to focus on what we don't have. And that's what the disciples did. Even after they witnessed this miraculous feeding of the 5,000, later when Jesus shares his compassion for another hungry crowd before them, they once again protest, we don't have enough to feed them. So how did Jesus challenge and change their focus on what they didn't have? How many loaves do you have? He asked them. And when they brought what little they had to him, he again blessed and multiplied it for the sake of the 4,000 hungry before him. And so this Christmas, we can offer God what we do have to give. And you can ask him to bless and to multiply the joy and the gratitude and the love. So church, what do you have? What has God given you? How might we focus our hearts and our minds on giving what we do have this holiday season, asking Jesus to bless and to multiply that? You know, truth be told, some people would rather actually have experiences with us anyway. They'd rather us be with them or call them more often than have us buy them something. And the gift of being present with them might be what would bless them most of all in this season when we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. And so this Christmas, we can honor Jesus with our gift giving when our giving reflects who Jesus is, how he lived, and how he calls us to live. As we expand our imagination, we can connect with why we give gifts at Christmas, to remember the gifts given at Jesus' birth as acts of worship. As we expand how we give and to whom we give and what we give, we reflect the greatest giver of all, the one who really saw people, who sees all of us just as we are and loves us just as we are. And so as we depend on Jesus to bless and multiply the gifts that we give, we honor him and his heart and his intention to bless others and to bless us to be a blessing. And so our gift giving this Christmas can honor Jesus by reflecting who he is and how he lived and how he calls us to live. Our king, our priest, Our sacrifice has shown us what is good. Jesus shows us what it looks like to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. And so we actually become more like Jesus as we give gifts that reflect his heart, his passion, his love, his generosity, his care for the oppressed, his desire to see justice done. And so as we seek to give gifts in a way that honors Jesus, we discover it can, in fact, be more blessed to give than to receive because we are participating in the life, the nature, the character of Jesus, our giving God, when we give gifts in this way. So that's the blessedness that we can experience this Christmas time, having our circumstances the circumstances of gift giving shape us and make us more like the son of God whom we already heard so love the world that he gave himself for the sins of the world that whoever might believe in him might not perish but have eternal life. And so when our giving reflects who Jesus is, how he lived, how he calls us to live, we bring honor to his name and joy to our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us Jesus. 
Thank you for giving us the opportunity to honor him as we give gifts to others this Christmas. By the power of your spirit, expand our hearts and our holy imagination, even our very intentions as we give gifts this Christmas. And may we discover that it is truly more blessed to give than to receive. Glorify yourself, we pray, through the gifts you empower us to give. It's for your name's sake that we pray this. Amen. Oh. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Uh, just some invitations for you. If you'd like prayer for any reason, anything going on with you, we have a prayer team. And right over here, you can come forward, come to the prayer team, and just tell them what they can pray for you. They'll keep it confidential. They'll pray for you. Uh, if you'd like to uh, talk with uh, Caitlin and Joel, uh, maybe help them network, say, hey, I want to introduce you to somebody. Let, you know, I want to take one of their, one of their cards. Uh, the two of you will be right over here. Perfect. And you guys can gather with them over there. And if you're interested in the uh, Christmas bazaar that we have going on, the, the Do Good Shop, there on the black uh, tablecloth is the Do Good Shop. And the white tablecloth are the artists in our own church that have created things to sell and then donating those proceeds uh, to help people as well. So that's how you can uh, do that. We're really grateful for you. And, uh, and we just thank you for, uh, for all the ways that you make a difference in this world. So, Caitlin, can you offer the benediction? Absolutely. Now, if you would like, I'd like to invite you to open your hands. This is our body signaling to our minds that we're in the posture of receiving a blessing. All right. Now, may the Holy Spirit empower you this Christmas as you seek to give gifts in a way that honors Jesus, that remembers how he lived and the way he lived and who he lived for. And so as you give gifts this Christmas, may you discover that it is indeed more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.